now have a time for open discussion. I invite uh, any questions or comments any of you might make here. With the question, please make it clear who you are addressing. Yes. It was interesting that uh, Dr. Augustine mentioned about the White Wall incident. And what I have heard is that just a month before, there was an international training course in White Wall, training people in physical security. And just a month later, this event happened. So how do we make training more effective? In other words, when you have training and then something like this happens a month later, the training doesn't seem to have had much effect. That's a profound question that I wish I had an answer to. Uh, the, uh, uh, this was a case where the, the challenge was recognized and uh, uh, for a variety of reasons uh, we never were able to focus on the sorts of things you cite and we paid a price for it. Uh, as I mentioned also uh, coming back uh, Dr. Sandhu, to your comments, uh, uh, it had been recommended uh, that we take these fragmented organ 22 organizations and try to compile them. And uh, there, a very good point was made that you have to be careful you don't create a super bureaucratic organization that, where you don't have uh, uh, creativity, imagination, fast on your feet uh, people. But uh, just as a, maybe an interesting case study, if you will, uh, at the time that we created the Department of Homeland Security, uh, I was uh, on the President's Council of Advisors on, on, on terrorism, on Homeland Security, actually. And uh, so I was spending a good deal of time trying to help our government to figure out how to organize the Department of Homeland Security. Uh, at the same time, uh, the company I was working for uh, we had just made a number of major acquisitions and by coincidence uh, we were in the process of acquiring 22 different companies, uh, the same number of the elements of the Department of Homeland Security. Uh, we had almost exactly the same total budget uh, as the Department of Homeland Security, uh, which was like, uh, at that time I think it was $45 billion a year. Uh, we had the same employment. It was about 185,000 people as the Department of Homeland Security. And within a year from the time that the company acquired those, put those 22 organizations together, they operated as one organization. They truly did. Uh, the Department of Homeland Security, uh, as good as it is, is still struggling, in my opinion, to act as one entity. And uh, uh, it's as I've learned from spending 10 years in our government, it's just a lot harder in governments in a democracy to make things happen than it is in the private sector where people who don't get with the program get somewhere else. And uh, it's, it's just a challenge that we face. And uh, I've not answered your question, which is a good question, uh, but I think it, uh, well, I probably said all I can say. tell you the reality of the situation is that if a terrorist strike occurs anywhere, uh, the jurisdiction, the, the, the administration of the jurisdiction that is hurt is pretty interested in first of all clearing up the place and trying to get a successful prosecution, a successful detection and a prosecution. And they therefore work very hard. But also if they discern in a little bit of time that they're not, not going to be able to make any headway, then they, then they invoke central support and the National Investigation Agency comes in. So there's little resistance to invoking central support. 
whether it's a question of flying in the NSG, whether it's a question of flying in forensic teams, bomb disposal experts, or even expert investigators. So I don't see this as an area where there's any competition per se. And I find, for the most part, that, that provincial jurisdictions are quite happy to receive the additionalities that, are necessar that necessarily come to the table when the central government gets involved and the, and, the, and, the, and the possibilities grow very, very quickly. For example, um, it would be very difficult for the states to invoke the support of, let's say, the FBI to help them investigate the explosive materials, to try and match the kind of explosive that has been used there against a database which is huge, which is lying in the FBI. Equally, it would be very difficult for them to invoke the support of the CIA for any, any help they might need on the intel side of things. So the, I don't think there's any hesitation on the part of state jurisdictions to, to, to sort of invoke the support of and seek the involvement of central government and central agencies. Well, my answer would be very similar. I think one of the things that we have accomplished uh, since, since the events of 9-11 is that we, we do have a very clear agreed upon protocol of who is responsible for what. And uh, to oversimplify, and I'm going to ask my colleagues to expand if they, if they wish, uh, to oversimplify the initial tactical response is left to the local, uh, uh, local organizations. And uh, if the events become uh, are greater than they're able to deal with, then the federal government comes in and helps. Uh, even in the former case, uh, the federal government has much better forensic capability, for example, and so the local governments could ask for uh, support and do. Uh, so there, there is a point at which uh, authority transitions depending on the nature of the attack, but it clearly starts out with the local authorities, the first responders in charge. Now, having given that as a broad answer, uh, would any of my colleagues want to expand on that? Also, an interesting aspect that uh, in the U.S., about 90 percent of the assets that are to be protected uh, don't belong to the government; they belong to the private sector. And so, uh, I think we're not yet as good as we need to be. Uh, and how do you bring in the private sector? And there uh, certainly has been work done in that area uh, through industrial associations, through contacts with individual organizations, but. Uh, for example, our, our power systems, our food supply, uh, uh, any number of other critical elements, uh, our rail transportation, air transportation, are principally in the, in the private sector. Things may start out very locally and end up 
much bigger and bring in a better government. And the uh, National Incident Management System is a system that's designed to be very flexible and as things get larger to bring in other agencies so that they can they can you know bring in other capabilities. And we in my my world in the port world we've used that many times where something started out or was responded to by a local law enforcement agency and then subsequent to that pulled in customs, uh, FBI, and many of the other agencies to uh, work cooperatively together. And at the end of the day, what the blueprint does, and it's a great thing, is it allows for things like uh, joint handling of constituents groups, <coughs> joint press releases, and of course, I know that what everybody wants to do when something happens is respond to the event, but you also have to be able to deal with these other externalities that, that, that are quite sometimes quite difficult to deal with, dealing with labor organizations, dealing with the media. And the incident management system, which is something that was actually developed locally in California and became adopted by the, by the U.S. government, is, has been the, the template that's been used for many, many years in responding to all kinds of incidents, anything. And it's very flexible. You can respond to a WFD event, or you can, it was actually developed in responding to brush fires in California. But it's a flexible way of including, being very inclusive to all the agencies and bringing a blueprint to bring everybody together to work on uh, dealing with an incident. I think I'll answer on the critical infrastructure um, to follow up on Mr. Ministry. It's 90% critical infrastructure in the U.S. is owned by the private sector, which makes it very interesting when you have a cyber incident. And probably in one of my slides, I'll do a case study, because Steve just mentioned it's better to do a case study. It's a trauma one critical hospital, which means, I mean, there's only one trauma one center pretty much based on a state. And this hospital was on a constant attack for cyber, taking down every single EKG machine, EAG machine, endoscopy, you name it, ventilators were down. The local state law enforcement does not have the capability neither to detect nor to prompt the cyber attack. So it's a classic example where the private side of the forensic investigators were brought in. The state police were observing and really coordinating with the Justice Department. So rather than making it a cyber law enforcement incident, they wanted to contain the attack first before they took on an investigative path. So they contained the attack more like a civilian thing. And eventually, because it's a hospital, they have to bring it back up in 24 hours. And then let the teams do what they need to do. And then it became a law enforcement incident. Trying to look at it. So there are a lot of those things which really work in a very cohesive way rather than putting it into restriction. They try to contain an attack first and then think about who is the jurisdiction. It's a multi-state, then FBI takes it over. If it's solely within a particular state, in this case, it was a multi-state, multi-country, so the Justice Department involved several other counter-terror specialists to see if there's a terrorism or it's just a new sensical attack from a country X. So it was a classic example to show how people work very closely, more than seven departments, in a very collective way. So we've seen that more and more happen between state lines, especially during insider threat attacks. Even on state governments, it's a classic example. They have to go to the attorney general and to the state police departments, but both departments really don't have those expertise. The beauty in the US is you have several FBI field officers who have the capability or can reach the national pool right away to help. So that's a classic thing where people can share resources within less than 24 hours. That's a beauty of the whole thing. People come to start working together. I mean, putting a lot of things aside, and then they take it to a law enforcement manual. So I think that worked pretty well, uh, in at least a few cases. Dave France. Uh, Mr. Augustine mentioned the importance of culture in a systems approach to, uh, to dealing with terrorism. Uh, and cultures, I believe, are defined by, by humans. Uh, hopefully humans with leadership skills and with, uh, with deep technical depth. And I think that, that technical depth uh, or having expertise in areas, in many areas, is important in mean, dealing with terrorism because there's so many unknowns. We can't plan for a specific, uh, specific kind of problem. In the world that I grew up in, which was the military, uh, medical, biological defense world, I've seen us 
go from during the Cold War, where we had the technical expertise, to uh, a model where we're sort of running people through the system and checking checking boxes and making sure they have some experience, but not leaving them, trying to get them promoted, but not leaving them in place long enough to become experts. Can you comment on, on how that situation is working in India and whether you found uh, a solution to, to assure that you'll have the right young people coming up with experts? I think this is an area where we are still challenged. We haven't been able to uh, overcome the cultural obstacles to, to, to creating a uniform, uniformly acceptable uh, plan of action. No. Um, Mr. Augustine, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about some of the mistakes perhaps that were made in DHS that inhibit the, the systems approach, mistakes that we're trying to address and that probably no one else should repeat that perhaps learn from the errors that made. Yeah, I, I should probably preface my remarks by saying overall I think, uh, <coughs> excuse me, the creation of DHS uh, was the right thing to do and is, is being carried out very well. But there are clear shortcomings and uh, the, uh, the, the principal shortcoming that, in my mind is that whereas we used to have a bunch of independent stovepipes, I'm going to overstate this for, to make the point, uh, today we have one organization with a bunch of independent stovepipes and uh, those stovepipes have to be broken down. and. Uh, uh, that requires strong leadership at the top and strong support uh, at the bottom, uh, neither of which are always easy to come by. And, uh, we'll get there, but it's taken an awful lot longer than, than it seems to me it, it should have. Uh, also, I think that uh, uh, DHS has not uh, advanced as I had hoped it would in the technology area. Uh, the, uh, the original plans included a strong technology effort uh, within or at least funded by DHS and uh, Department of Homeland Security for those who are not familiar with the initials. Uh, but that technology effort has never uh, grown to the degree that, uh, that many of us had hoped it would. And that I think has partly been a cultural issue that the, most of the entities that made up uh, DHS were not particularly high-tech organizations. Uh, the leadership has generally not been uh, people with strong technology backgrounds, all of their exceptions. And uh, then funding, uh, we just never funded that particular effort. So those would be some of the things that would come to my mind. Thank you, I'm Rita Gunther from the National Academy of Sciences. I have a question for each of our distinguished speakers this morning. First, uh, Mr. Sandhu, I was wondering if you could speak uh, just a bit more about the review committees that you mentioned in your uh, remarks in terms of uh, who might comprise those committees and how you seek perhaps uh, expertise, scientific expertise in those review committees when the area or the topic uh, permits it or would benefit from that. And then, Mr. Augustine, I have a question for you as someone who has a very broad and diverse set of experiences. How would you, uh, how would you say we, one should go about organizing the thought process to start an assistance approach? In other words, the thinking before one actually can implement the systems approach. Are there a set of questions that one should ask uh, or how, how does one even start to think about developing that systems approach? Thank you. I guess when you spoke about the review committee, you're talking about the one which I talked about in terms of monitoring of communication. It might, it might astound the audience here that uh, we depend on a, on a legislation of 1885 to conduct our monitoring. It's called the Indian Telegraph Act. 
and uh, the second and supplementary uh, legislation that helps us in this area, particularly for data, is the Information Technology Act, which came in in 2000. The uh, the Indian Telegraph Act of 1885, Section 5, Subsection 2 of which gives the government the authority to monitor communications has been under review several times. It's been challenged, challenged very often. But I think the most critical judgment came out of the Supreme Court in 1999. It's actually, it was taken to court in 96. In 1999, we had a very detailed judgment about how, uh, first of all, it, it upheld the authorities available to government under the Telegraph Act to carry out monitoring in specific cases. Secondly, it laid out guidelines as to how those powers were to be exercised. And thirdly, it, it insisted on a better review mechanism. And the government had to do all this and then go back to Supreme Court and satisfy it with re reference to what had been put in place. So with reference to the review, uh, first of all, with reference to the approvals, uh, if there's any stack within government that needs monitoring, there are only seven or eight authorized agencies that can do it. Uh, you, they have to develop uh, the, the, the reasons for the request within the institution. The head of the institution has to take it upon himself to satisfy himself that it is actually a justified request. And he will approach the Union Home Secretary, that's like the federal uh, person in charge of internal security. And the Home Secretary's office will examine it and decide whether to accept it or not, not to accept it. It's worth noting, first of all, that all requests have to relate to an entity. There can't be a bucket, uh, you can't just draw buckets of traffic out of whatever. So it has to be with reference to an entity and he has to take a decision. It's also interesting to note that 20% of the requests so made are rejected. The, uh, every month thereafter, there's a review committee that meets, the cabinet secretary, the topmost official of the government of India, supported by the law secretary who looks after the legal affairs within government of India and the Department of Telecommunications Secretary, who's not a part of the authorization process, but whose department facilitates the implementation of the orders issued to the Home Secretary. They look at these orders and decide which are the ones that can be allowed to stay on and which have to be struck down. And there again, we have a 15% failure rate uh, at the end of the review committee. Uh, orders are usually valid for 60 days and the review committee meets well, well within that so if it judges any particular enterprise to be not appropriate, it calls it off and everything related to that enterprise has to be destroyed and put away. So that's how it works. Incidentally, this, this process, uh, the review committee and so on, was taken back to the Supreme Court and they were asked to satisfy themselves as to whether this was adequate and they said it was. And ever since it's continued as, as such. And we haven't, have, we've had many interventions thereafter by by enthusiastic lawyers who still wish to question the methods in place. Well, the Supreme Court has again come back and said that this is enough. Uh, with regard to your question about uh, how one would go about uh, creating a uh, systems uh, capability, uh, for example, within the Department of Homeland Security, I assume, or within the government as a whole, uh, unfortunately, traditional organization charts uh, do not lend themselves well to taking a systems approach. And the reason for that is that uh, organizations tend to be broken up into uh, entities that carry out a given function or a given mission. And that's so you can get the job done, which makes a lot of sense. But it doesn't uh, lend itself well to doing trade-offs between the various uh, elements of the organization. Uh, so my belief is that what's needed is a very small group at the very top uh, with the overall assignment uh, uh, prevent terrorism. Uh, that, that's simple. Not simple in execution, but simple in statement. And that uh, that group has the overview to address any issue uh, that relates to, uh, to terrorism and its impact. Uh, Years ago, I served in the Department of Defense, which at that time uh, was certainly uh, uh, stovepiped uh, in terms of uh, what it did. There were very few trade-offs made. And 
they created a small group, uh, maybe 20 people. Uh, very imaginative people, uh, the kind Dr. Sandhu referred, referred to as creative, uh, innovative, uh, and gave them the task to do trade-offs. And they somehow, this was during the Cold War, they did trade-offs between uh, civil defense and the, the number of submarines we had. Uh, your first reaction is, how do you do that? And uh, I will never, they, they certainly came, they never came up with a universal equation that lets you do that but they shed an awful lot of light on, on it. And uh, basically it became an issue of uh, how do you invest your resources uh, to, uh, to deal with this overall issue. Uh, whereas uh, at the time I was in the Defense Department, it was always amazing to me that for many years, a third of the budget went to the Army, a third to the Air Force, and a third to the Navy. Uh, now that's quite a coincidence if you know that that should be the optimum way to spend your budget. And, uh, and I'm not suggesting it was easy to get away from that, but movement was made in that direction. And it needs to change from time to time, depending on the circumstances. And one last thing that I would add to Dr. Gunther's question, and uh, I'm a strong believer that uh, a systems group like I've described uh, needs to have not only a strong intelligence input, but to have a strong red team that uh, can pretend to be the other side, to be the bad guys, and to uh, uh, try to learn to think uh, like the opponents think. That's not easily done, and uh, that nonetheless make, doesn't make it less important. I, I think there's a, a lot of benefit to be done from that. And also to uh, bring in independent uh, outside uh, thinkers to uh, challenge them. and. Uh, when I was involved with our, our army, uh, uh, we had some facilities that I was concerned about, and our, our army assured me that they were absolutely secure. Uh, so I went to the Air Force Special Forces and the Navy SEALs and asked how secure were our army's facilities. Well, of course, this became a great challenge to them. And uh, we learned a lot of things that we wouldn't have learned by asking our army. And I don't demean our army in any way, but uh, it's, one can get brain locked, and uh, that's the thing one has to avoid. Uh, my question is uh, for Dr. Sandhu. Uh, systems approach is good, and you are developing some plan or uh, doing some research and development for defense activities. But when you are responding to some terrorist attack, Following a systems approach can prove to be very lexical, as it did in Mumbai terror attacks. Which, uh, it took three days to annihilate all the terrorists. So there must uh, there must be a need to develop state forces uh, for counterterrorism uh, tasks, and there must be some out of box thinking for such attacks where our response needed is quickest. What's your take on that, sir? But I don't think it's a systems approach that detracted from the efficiency that needed to have been brought to bear on the situation in Bombay. What you're referring to is the delay that was taken in, in negating the... Okay. It's also a function of the efficiency of the people who carry it out. And there are internal reviews that have showed... Uh, that have brought forth facts which are not in the public domain and which I'm not free to discuss. But the fact is that the inefficiencies of people impact on whatever, no matter how good the system, unless people are efficient about... Uh, with regard to your second point about the state police forces that need to have capacity, anti-terrorism response capacity, two things have been done. First of all, the National Security Guard, which is the key response uh, mechanism, has uh, now got regional hubs. Bombay happens to be one of the hubs. Calcutta, Bangalore, uh, was it Calcutta, Chennai, uh, Delhi and Bombay. We have four regional hubs. So that brings the response capacity closer to the possible uh, areas of attack. And then in terms of Maharashtra, you're probably aware of something called Force One. That's that's a new outfit that was created after 2008. It's just the kind of thing you're talking about. A state-owned capacity to deal with terrorists uh, in the tactical manner in which they have to be dealt with. Something like a SWAT team with no integral component yet for investigation. Uh, 
but they are but just what you said and other states are rather than create new forces most of them are going to the uh, going into the domain of uh, reinforcing their anti terror squads and their special task forces to give them the teeth that are, that are necessary to deal with a, a violent incident like that Mr. Sadhu, could you provide some book readings we might look at in terms of the Mumbai case? I know a book that's received a lot of attention in the United States is called The Seek uh, by, I guess, two Canadian or French journalists. It, it, it's a, a better book than that. You said that some information has not been made public, but what is public that would be useful for this guy? I think the I think Nas has done a great job in terms of inviting some folks across the day after tomorrow to talk about the Bombay attack. I'm hoping I was just talking to Professor Sundaresh, and I'm hoping that we'll be able to get Sadat Sadanand Date, who is the Joint Commissioner of Police in the Bombay Police, uh, to come here and speak to you about the attack. He's one of the guys who was at one of the venues and actually fought the terrorists and was injured, was injured in the process, and he's fully familiar with what happened and how it happened. So I would rather suggest that you know he would be a good resource person to interact with, because he could give you an authoritative and as near to the ground account of what what happened and what the failings were. He's been associated with all aspects of the tactical response. He's been associated with the investigation, and he's been associated with the reviews that followed. There is a, a report that uh, Mr. R. D. Sathe made on the on the Mumbai attacks. I don't know if you've seen it. It's available on the net. Uh, there were two of them. R.D. Sathe was one and the other one... Uh, was, sorry? Balachan, maybe. Yeah, yeah so, so there is that report. It's about 100 odd pages. If you read the executive summary, that by itself is pretty pretty interesting and tells you something about uh, what happened on, on that particular day. But Date would be a great resource. And I don't know whether you've got any... Yeah, faxed Sorry? You've faxed it, yeah. So we've got... I've, I've just got... I've spoken to him and got confirmation on the phone that he will be able to come, and I think that's the best guy. Uh, I see, may I ask you made an interesting statement. Um, you were discussing how, how the Homeland Security uh, system is set up, about leadership with strong technical background as necessary. Could you expand on that a little bit? Uh, how did you collect such people, and what role did they actually play in um, uh, in establishing the homeland security system? I recall that at that time there were extensive and quite intense debates in the United States about the about the idea. That's a very good question, and uh, I guess what I was referring to was the importance of having people uh, with a strong technical background because uh, so many of the problems as well as so many of the solutions to problems the world faces uh, are technical. Uh, certainly terrorism is an example in, in many instances, not all. Uh, I wish I could say that uh, we uh, were very successful in attracting a large number of technical people into our government to, to do this. Uh, frankly, we were not. Uh, we uh, we have some technical people, uh, uh, relatively senior levels, but uh, disproportionately few. And for some reason, uh, within our nation, uh, it's it's fairly unusual for technical people to take senior positions in government. Uh, we have a, a trivial representation in our Congress of technical people. And I think that's one of the concerns that we should have, uh, is that uh, uh, a part of it is the fault of uh, technologists such as myself, uh, who uh, uh, many just don't want to be involved with politics. They find it offensive, and so it's hard to get them to go into government. Uh, not hard to get them to criticize government. Uh, the other, I think, is that uh, we have created over the years uh, many conflict of interest rules that have made it very hard for people to have a career both in government and outside. Uh, uh, I spent two tours in government and uh, 
uh, I couldn't do that today under today's conflict of interest rules. Uh, some would say that's good, others would say maybe it's not. Uh, but the fact is, uh, I guess what I was stating was my belief that uh, it's important to have competent technical people in these senior jobs uh, where there's a lot of technology involved. And uh, candidly, we just don't do a very good job of it. Some of my colleagues, I'll bet, could expand on that. Would anybody want to tackle that? Surely not everybody agrees with me. Okay, everybody does agree with me. <laughs> My question is to Mr. Augustine. It's uh, A.K. Shinha from NDMA. Uh, since 2001, uh, uh, anthrax attack in the United States, uh, at the global level, lots of focus has been done, uh, given to the bioterrorist attack and bio threats emanating from uh, natural sources as well. Uh, in, uh, as per my information, in the 2001 attack, we had hardly five casualties in U.S. But subsequent to that, in 2009, the swine flu uh, outbreak epidemic pandemic, we have quite a large number of uh, casualties all across the world. This brings us to the question of addressing this issue of bio-risk management uh, from two perspectives. Uh, be it uh, security-centric, and another is public health security-centric approach. Uh, irrespective of the sources of this uh, accidental or it, um, deliberate attack, the co consequences are almost similar. How, uh, in U.S., your system approach addresses to make a balance between these two, uh, uh, not complementary, but a little bit uh, contradictory positions uh, to manage the virus first. And uh, at, at the same time, it also involves a lots of uh, intersectoral cooperation between security establishments and, plurals, uh, and health uh, public officials, doctors, medical, veterinarians. Uh, so how your system approach addresses these two issues? Let's see, with your permission, I'm going to defer that to one of my colleagues who might be better equipped to uh, address that. Uh, who, who would, uh, Dave, would you, that, Dave just volunteered. I was afraid of that. Um, actually, you've, you've, you've touched on a point that, that I think is very important, and I've long said that we should have an all hazards approach, but I would give it to our CDC. Uh, but it becomes a, this is for bio issues, whether it's H1N1 or H5N1 or a bioterrorism attack, but it again becomes a cultural issue, I think. Uh, my sense is that the CDC feels they have more important things to do than work on security issues, although they've become much more involved than they ever were. And they were first funded for biosecurity in 1998. Before that, they had no funding, but they did work with us in DOD to some degree. And it, as long as we're separating uh, and having one group waiting for a bioterrorism attack, which will maybe be rare, and another group working with naturally occurring uh, emerging infectious disease, which are quite common, who do you think is going to be most competent? to deal with a bioterrorism attack. So I would, I would use an all-hazards approach, give it to the, the medics, give it to the CDC if, if I had the choice, but then add a few extra important uh, capabilities that we would need for a terrorist attack. I think what we've done is looked at it as a security problem, and we've added some medical uh, That, that's sort of my sense. Does that help with the answer or no? My uh, second part of my question, which actually says that. Maybe, maybe keep it uh, short, please, because we should be breaking now too much. My point was that how you make a balance between the security and the health security imperatives, especially uh, uh, the areas like bio bioforensic investigation, that requires totally altogether dedicated technical uh, expertise for that. But it's into the domain of law enforcement also. How you manage that? I think we've been quite successful. I haven't been involved in that. But uh, right after 10-4, which is <coughs> the anthrax letters, 9-11 and 10-4 are the two references, uh, we started putting on a, uh, an FBI individual 
with our CDC as they did their epidemiological studies of naturally occurring outbreaks. And I think that was a very positive thing and very useful. So now we have forensic FBI folks who are uh, have an understanding of medical and infectious disease epidemiology, which we didn't have before. And I think that's fairly easily done. Uh, my earlier point was, I think it would be better to have the medics in charge and responsible and pull in the security piece as needed, for example, uh, your second question, uh, rather than have the security folks uh, responsible and pull in the medics, because medics don't always respond very, we medics, I should add, don't always respond uh, as, as we should probably. And, it's, and, it, and it, I really believe it's cultural. Well, I'm afraid that we have to close the session. I want to thank our speakers here, Dr. Augustine and uh, Sandhu, and all of you for keeping this discussion so lively and interesting. Thank you all very much.